let's talk about indiv- indivisible stochastic processes. But I must remind you, I'm still a 12 year old. Ah, okay, good. You're a 12 year old. Okay, let's let's do this. Okay. So let's go back to our picture. There's um, phenomena, mm-hmm. things out in the world behaving in various ways, and we want to use mathematical rules to describe what they're going to do and make predictions about them. The phenomena appear to exhibit patterns. We want to capture those patterns using mathematical language, and then we want to use that mathematical language ideally to make predictions. We've talked about how sometimes those rules can be deterministic, tell you exactly what's going to happen, and sometimes they can be probabilistic. Let's consider a system, a thing, uh, a, a kind of thing out in the world that's doing things, exhibiting various patterns. And let's suppose that the best we can do to capture the patterns we see is to assign probabilities to some of those patterns. Okay? We've got an object of some kind. It can be configured like this or configured like that. It can be here. It can be there. We call these different possible configurations. And this thing is behaving in kind of a strange somewhat unpredictable way, but we can assign probabilities in some cases to how it will behave. We can capture its behavior using probabilities. Okay. These probabilities could be, what's the probability right now that it's in this configuration versus that configuration? And some of these probabilities instead look like if it's in this configuration at this so-called conditioning time, this starting time, if you want, given that, then what's the probability that it will be in that configuration conditional at probability. that target time? We call that a conditional probability. Yeah. And suppose we have a bunch of those too. And that's it. I must point out these are classical probabilities, very different from those measurement probabilities you pointed out right. earlier with the wave function. I haven't used the word measurement here. I'm saying these are probabilities of what configuration system is in. Yeah. We call those standalone probabilities. And then conditional probabilities, probabilities of the form given or assuming it is in such and such configuration at this conditioning time. You're redefining the picture, which is classical probabilities. Yep. These are all classical. Well, classical is a bit of a, of a, of a tricky word. I would yeah. call them ordinary probabilities. Ordinary, okay. <laughs> because if you think classical, you maybe think Newtonian mechanics. Newtonian mechanics describes things using deterministic laws. Yeah, I see the confusion. Uh, the word classical has a physics meaning. Let's just say ordinary probabilities. Ordinary feels demeaning, but, I, but we'll, we'll work with it. <laughs> ordinary. How about... Uh, uh, conventional, maybe. Uh, conventional has somewhat. Yeah, how about uh, old school? Old school. Old, old school, school probability. Vintage probability. Vint- vintage. Oh, great! Vintage probability. I hope the term sticks. And this is yeah. the. This is this the. This is the place. <laughs> this is vintage the place. probabilities. These are vintage probabilities. Okay. They have the usual rules of vintage probabilities. They are uh, good old fashioned ordinary real numbers that go from zero to one. They sum to one. You can uh, marginalize. You can do all the usual, cla- all the usual ordinary vintage things with them. Good. And that's it. Mm. And you're like, well, what do you mean that's it? Well, what else? Yeah. What are their ingredients? What are the laws? And I'm no, no other laws. That's it. That's what we're saying. We're saying we have a model in which all we know are the standalone probabilities, maybe at every time, and we have these conditional probabilities that connect pairs of times. Yeah. Remarkably, this kind of a model can be re-expressed in the mathematical language of Hilbert spaces. And when one does so, one arrives at the same axioms you get in textbook quantum theory. Can I take a digression? Why wasn't it done? Because we were aware of this vintage old school probability theory. Why did they invent this new system of probabilities when we had this already? So we had old-fashioned probabilities, but people assumed that in any reasonable model that used probabilities to describe the behavior of systems, that you had to be given probabilities for everything. You had to be given the probability that the system will be in such and such configuration 
at this time and such and such configuration at that time and such and such configuration at that time and such and such configuration at that time and that conditioned on the, you know, uh, that it's in such a configuration at this conditioning time and that it's in this in configuration at this other conditioning time. And people assume that you had these very, very, very extensive so-called joint probability distributions. They could assign probabilities to the configuration the system is in at large numbers of times. Now, that's a lot of different probabilities. It's a huge number. In fact, it's infinitely many distinct probabilities that you would need. And so in practice, people would rarely try to formulate a model this way. What they would do is they would say, okay, well, maybe the model has all these probabilities, a whole tower of higher and higher order joint and conditional probabilities conditioned on more and more and more and more things, depending on more and more and more things. But maybe all of these high order ones happen to numerically agree with just the simplest ones, the ones that are conditioned on just one earlier time and tell you the next time. They're all there. All those higher order probabilities are there. They're just, they're just equal numerically to these lower, lowest order ones. For a system like this, we have the feature that if you tell me what the system is, what its configuration is at any one moment, we can predict at least probabilistically and in some cases deterministically what its configuration will be at later moments. And this is called a Markov system. It is very important to remember that for a Markov system, we still have all those other probabilities, all those second and third and fourth and higher, those, you know, more and more complicated conditional and joint probabilities. It's just that they are numerically equal to the simplest ones. And from the simplest ones, we can then predict the behavior of the system. Okay. And people just assumed that those were your options. Either you have a bunch of higher order conditional probabilities that are distinct or you only have the lowest order ones. I guess there are other options, like maybe you have the lowest and second order ones, maybe you have the lowest, second, and third order ones. There are various levels of not being Markovian. You could be maximally non-Markovian and then they're all different. But you could have second order non-Markovian or third order where maybe the first and second and third orders are different, you know, or you could just have regular Markovian, which is all that matters is the most recent time that you condition on and nothing else. And once you know that, you can always, you can then make predictions about the future behavior of the system. Now I should say that for something like Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian mechanics is actually not quite Markovian. Newtonian mechanics, you have to know the configuration of your system now and at an infinitesimally earlier moment, or equivalently the configuration now and the velocity now, they're the same. And then with that, you can make further predictions. Over the time dt. Over time dt. But you make time. that, a, like you just make that approximation to make it Markovian. That's right. What you do is you basically, Add to your configurations, either the configurations at a DT earlier, like an infinite time earlier, yeah. or you add your configurations to the velocity, and then you can pretend that the system is Markovian. So you're saying even in Newtonian mechanics, it is non-Markovian, but by just making a slight tweak, we just exactly. make it Markovian. This yeah. is a trick known as constructing a hidden Markov model, taking a non-Markovian model and right. making it look Markovian by including some of that additional data into your present, what you mean by your present configuration. This turns out not to work so well if the model is infinitely ordered non-Markovian. Because then there's just too much information to squeeze in, exactly. Yeah. What people didn't seem to realize was that there are even simpler models than Markov models. Models in which we don't specify the higher order probabilities at all. They're not supplied by the model. It's not that we specify them and then equate them to the first order ones. We don't specify them to begin with. They're not provided by the model. And in fact, not even all of the Markov probabilities, the first order ones are supplied. These models have simpler, sparser conditional probabilities, fewer. In particular, they fail to be Markovian, not because they have extra structure, but because they have less. And these models have come to be called indivisible stochastic processes a term that goes back to the quantum information literature in 2006, 2008, in a paper by Ignacio Chirac and Mikhail Wolf on quantum channels, but got its name referring to ordinary probability type processes in a review article in PRX Quantum from 2021, preprint 2020. It's open access, you can go read it, by Simon Mills and Kevin Modi. These processes are simpler than Markov processes. They have fewer conditional probabilities. And they fail to be Markov in the sense that uh, you can't just pick any time you want and take that to be a conditioning time and then predict probabilistic where the system will be. 
if you want to predict what the system will be, you may have to go back to some previous conditioning time that is available. These conditioning times are called division events. Okay. And this means that these systems are not Markovian, but in a way that is more rudimentary than a conventional textbook non-Markovian system. And as best I can tell, these weren't studied because no one noticed them. People just didn't consider them until basically four years ago, five years ago. Um, I didn't read the literature on indivisible processes originally. I stumbled on them because I was trying to explain quantum theory in a class I was teaching. And I ended up trying to find a connection between stochastic processes and quantum theory. And I ended up realizing I needed these processes. I also call them indivisible. But then I went back and I discovered that just a few years later, the same name had been used for the same processes. In fact, the same symbol. I was using a capital Greek letter gamma for my, to represent these processes. And it was the same letter that was being used in this, in this review article. Um, I was afraid I was going to be scooped, but the article didn't make any connection between them and quantum processes. They just, the article noted in figure six uh, that, I think page 15 or something like that, 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 that they were a thing you could define, but then no further mention was made of them. Um, and I felt a, a giant like, sigh of relief. Okay, no one noticed that these things are actually important. Reminds me of David Bohm and De Broglie independently right. rising, uh, arriving at the same same theory. Sorry, just while we're here, can I just take a quick digression, zoom in, you mentioned indivisibility and these uh, cuts that you're making. What's deciding where you get to make this cut in this giant analog ocean of values that you could have? That's right. So uh, cuts is not quite the right word for it, and they're not done by hand. Mm -hmm. You simply let the process unfold, and at various times, division events will spontaneously show up. They show up when the system you're studying, the system you're looking at, interacts in the right way with another system. So these are emergent divisions? They're emergent divisions. Okay. They're not put in by hand. They emerge from how your system interacts with other systems. Not fundamental. They're not fundamental. Um, they happen when your system interacts with other systems. If the other system interacts with the system in question um, in a way that where it develops what's called a classical correlation, an ordinary old-fashioned correlation between the configuration of the system looking at your system and your system. And the system looking at it can be anything. It doesn't have to be an observer. It, doesn't, it could be just a particle. It could be just the simplest thing. When the right kind of interaction happens and you do a, a process called ordinary old-fashioned vintage <laughs> marginalization, what you find is that the system you're studying develops an effective break in its evolution. Uh, the uh, conditional probabilities develop another available conditioning time called a division event. Okay. And so these division events are just sort of popping up sort of more or less all the time. The more isolated a system is, the fewer division events it will have. If it's perfectly isolated, it won't ever have any. Uh, but for like a system that's very big, interacting with a big environment that's reading off its configuration, it's going to have rapid division events. And it, because it has so many of them, you can condition on basically any time you want, and you're going to return to the old kind of dynamics that we're familiar with, the old kind of dynamical laws that we're familiar with, with uh, from, from pre-quantum physics. Um, there's nothing fundamental about division events. We're not fundamentally saying that certain times are magically preferred over other times. This is more... Um, you know, all times are on equal footing. There's kind of a symmetry one time and another is just as good. But because of the way that systems happen and interact, those interactions spontaneously choose or spontaneously break the symmetry in time. Okay. Um, just like you existing as uh, an interesting geometric object and a person <laughs> spontaneously break the fact that the laws of nature are fundamentally rotation invariant. The laws of nature don't care which direction you're looking at. The, the laws of physics work the same in any direction you can mm. be looking in. But you, because you're not perfectly symmetric, you pick out a certain direction that's in front of you and a certain direction that's behind you and left and right. So objects pick out certain times. That's how these division events show up. Now, how does this resolve the measurement problem? There are no literal superpositions in this picture. Notice, I, I, I told you the whole picture. I didn't say wave functions. I didn't say no quantum collapsing. states. No collapsing. No. It's not that systems get into weird superpositions where your system is both here and there, and we need some mechanism to collapse it to one or the other. It was never in a superposition, so there's never a need to collapse, and there's no measurement problem. The measurement problem simply doesn't happen. There's no fundamental wave function, so there's no debate over is the wave function a physical object or not a physical object. No observer, no external No measurement. special role yeah. for observers. Observers are just regular systems, and you can use the same analysis that Bohm used to work out the process of observing. There's a sense in which this is most closely similar to Bohm's pilot wave theory among the available choices, but without the pilot wave, 
Uh, not deterministic. I it's Bohm's theory originally was deterministic, although the attempts to apply it to quantum field theory tend to be indeterministic anyway. Right. Um, but yes, it's, 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 it accepts the indeterminism of nature. It takes seriously what nature seems to be telling us. We do experiments. We see a unique outcome. The outcome appears to be probabilistic. There is reason to think that there is something inherently non-Markovian about quantum theory. There are, for, for one thing, there's a lot of work now on non-Markovian, just Google non-Markovian quantum and you're going to find a million results. But there's a paper, I think, that codifies this rather beautifully by Glick and Adami that was published in Foundations of Physics a few years ago. Uh, and uh, this paper uh, considers two ways to look at the process of measuring a quantum system. We have a quantum system and we have a measuring device. And the measuring device is pretty small, well isolated. One way we can do it is have the measuring device measure, make like uh, N measurements in succession and treat all those measurements as unitary evolution without activating the collapse, the measurement axioms. Let all N measurements happen with just increasing amounts of entanglement. And then at the very end, you, the external observer, come in and do one final measurement on the measuring device at the end and get the answer. That's option one. Option two is treat every one of the end measurements as a projective collapsing measurement. And you'll get different answers between option one and option two. It's like if you don't look at the measuring device in between, but only at the end, you get a different answer. And this is a distinctly non-Markovian behavior. So if we see things that look non-Markovian in quantum systems, I'm just saying take that seriously. Rather than look at all of these things and say, well, we see a definite result. It's probabilistic. Looks like only one thing happened. It looks like there's one copy of myself. And, but I'm just going to impose that the universe is in fact deterministic and there are many copies of myself. And I mean, it, it just seems like we're trying to hang on. I mean, when people talk about, oh, you're trying to hang on to a pre-quantum picture of the world. Determinism is part of a pre-quantum picture of the world. Demanding determinism at the cost of introducing zillions of parallel universes and all the problems of trying to make sense of how probability is supposed to show up as one does in the Everett approach, to me that seems like a pre-quantum assumption to make on our, on our theories. <laughs>